Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'ina ashadu wa la ilaha illallah ashadu wa muhammadin abduhu wa rasul ma ba'd wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I'm your host, Yusuf Estes and for the next little bit we're going to be talking about a subject one of my favorite subjects in Islam to talk about the subject of da'wah and what is da'wah, what does it mean and what is the obligation of the Muslim today and how can we go about doing this thing called da'wah and to begin with, it is an Arabic word. It has to be understood in the vernacular of the Arabiya, Lago Arabiya. So let's break it down and take a look at it. And what does it really mean? And actually, there's a word that a lot of Muslims are familiar with that comes from the same root called Dua. Dua and Dawa coming from the same thing, and that's to request or invite. And when we give Dua to Allah, we're requesting something of Allah. And we give da'wah to the people, we're inviting the people to something. So it's an invitation. And is this something that is obligatory on the Muslims? And in fact, when we look to the Quran, we find many cases where not only is it is something nice, something good, it is in fact a part of obedience to Allah to give this invitation to truth and correct belief and worship in Islam. Here in the Quran, we find the verse in Surah Al-Imran. You are the best nation raised up because you call the people to Al-Maruf and you forbid Al-Munkar. And you believe in Allah. This is the only place that we find in the Quran where some actions are coming ahead of belief. So the belief in Allah was subjugated to two actions. And that's strange when you consider from Surah Baqarah, which is chapter 2, and go all the way back to Surah Al-Asr, we find constantly this reference to meaning that the people who come to the correct belief and do the deeds of righteousness. However, in this particular ayah, which I just quoted from Ali Imran, we find that there are two deeds coming before this belief in Allah. So when we ask the scholars, the ulama of Islam about this, how did Allah subjugate these two actions in front of the belief in Allah? They said we well, have to understand those two actions, and that's by the way, in case you noticed, I didn't translate them, I left them in the Arabiya. Maruf wa munkar. What is al maruf and what is al munkar? Because in many of the translations, it will say you're the best of people raised up because you call the people to do good deeds and you forbid the people to do bad deeds and you believe in Allah. If that's all there were to it, then this would be strange because it means that your belief came later on after you were doing these actions. But in fact, Al-Maruf and Munkar in this are actually pertaining to the belief of Islam itself. Because in this case, a Maruf is a calling to the correct belief that la ilaha illallah, there is only one deity worthy to be worshipped. And he has no partners. And the only way you can reach him is through the path that he has laid out for you. That you will not be able to invent a religion better than the one that he has prescribed for you. In fact, the word Islam itself means the one who has submitted their choice to do the will of Almighty God. If you believe that, and you're trying to act on that, then you're doing Islam, and therefore you become a Mu-Islam, or Muslim. One who does Islam is a Muslim. When we understand that, then we begin to understand this Maruf is calling the people to the right belief. Because people cannot do acceptable actions to Almighty Allah unless they know who He is. They cannot be doing things for God and they don't even know there's a God. So the responsibility here that's placed on the Khairum, Umatin, the best of the people, the responsibility being placed on you as the good people here is to call the people to this correct belief and then what goes with it? And the actions that come after that are to do proper charity, proper kindness, proper respect, honor, obedience. And to do this with Allah for Allah. Because if we didn't do that, then what are we? We're just making up our own societies. And many societies have come and gone throughout the existence of human beings on the planet. 
But to call the people in Al Maruf to this subject of their correct belief and doing deeds for the sake of Almighty God is the highest and most noble of callings that there is. Then in the second part, when it says, and you forbid all munkar, what is a munkar? And it, generally speaking, it's something bad, something evil. But in reference to this particular verse of the Quran, it particularly means the munkar which takes people away from the correct belief and that there is only one God and takes them away from the correct actions which are the submission to him and obedience to him and doing what he has asked us to do. And that is, of course, to believe in him, following what he's ordered us. And you do that by reading the Quran and learning from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Then obedience to our parents in giving them the proper respect, dignity, and honor that they're due as parents. And then after that, the respect and dignity that we're to give to each and every single human being on the earth, regardless of their belief, we still have to do this. This is a part of being Muslim. So this is all a part of stopping the moon car, anything that prevents people from being good, believing, decent people. Allah warns us in the Quran when he says, Qabr al-Maqdin in the law. Hated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that you say something that you don't do. So you mustn't say what you don't do. And we want to back up what we call to with our own actions. And this is one of the best kind of da'wah there is. It's not what I'm saying. You're listening to me talk right now. But what does that really mean? If you don't know me, you don't watch me, you just say, oh, well, you know, we saw him on TV and that's enough. That isn't enough. What's inside the person's heart is very, very important. And that's really what counts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if I'm going to be a sincere Muslim, the first thing I have to do is change my whole attitude and my own way so that I'm in compliance with what Allah has ordered us to do. Once I've done this, then I begin to tell the other people what's Islam. But I mustn't wait until I perfect my Islam. No, 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 no. A part of perfecting the Islam is to call the people as soon as you know something is valuable, something good in Islam that needs to be done, then this is what we have to do. Because as we call to it, we ourselves are doing the same thing. The one who comes into Islam usually is the most excited about Islam. He's the best one to call other people to it. Many of the reverts to Islam that we have in the United States are some of the best callers to Islam and they don't even know the Arabic language yet. But they're enthused and excited about this. What? The correct belief that there really is a God. And there's proof of this God. Hard evidence that shows without any equivocation that Allah exists. He's one and he has the total authority of everything in the universe. And he's revealed to us his book, his Quran. And this is also a big part of the da'wah, is to call the people to read this book in the Arabic language. I know a lot of people tell me, why do you have to read in Arabic? Why don't you read it in another language? Allah revealed it in the Arabiya. And if you said, well, I don't know Arabic, so I can't be a Muslim. That's not true. Many people are Muslim today don't know their Arabic language. But the more you want to learn, the more you want to do, then it's worth it for you to spend six weeks, eight weeks, and begin to learn what is Arabic? How do I read it? How do I understand it? Nobody's going to tell you you can master the Arabic language in two or three lifetimes, much less a short period of time. But you don't have to master it to read the Quran. All you need to do is get started. We have some help for that, by the way, on our website. And I'm sliding off to a commercial. I'm good at that, by the way. I wanted to, to visit our websites and check it out. Learn how you can get involved in Islam more. You can learn about the Quran by translation and then begin to learn what these words mean. Today, I've talked about several of the words. I talked about maruf. I talked about munkar. I told you about the word da'wah and the word da'a. And maybe you knew these, maybe not. But the point is, that's where you start, one by one by one. You don't try to accomplish a journey by taking one step to go all the way from here in Bangalore, India, to Washington, D.C. Instead, it's the first step you take to get out the door, then to the car, then to the airport, then across the pond, as we used to call it, and then and so on. So you know that every journey that you take starts with a single step. And each of us is responsible to take the first step. Nobody's asking you to do more than you know, but do what you do know. Be the best of what you can as a Muslim. Now, I know that some of the things I've said today may be a little new to you, or maybe not the way you understood it before, but it's okay. Take your time. Take your Quran and begin to read and think about it. If you don't know the Arabiya, at least read the translation that you have and reflect and ask Allah to guide you. 
Even if you know the Arabic language, doesn't mean you know what's real Islam. This only comes from the guidance of Allah. And he can guide people with whatever he wants, any way that he wants. So we start inside of our heart, and we start real da'wah with du'a. And we say, oh Allah, guide me, guide my steps, guide my path, guide my tongue, guide my eyes, guide every part of me to be on the Surat al-Mustaqim, the straight path. And I'm praying for the guidance for myself first. Then I pray, oh Allah, guide my family, guide my wife, guide my children, my parents. Oh Allah, guide us. Then I pray for those in my outer family, my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, and other relatives. Then I will increase and ask Allah for the community of Muslims. Allahumma nizal islam wa muslimin. And then I will increase it even more and say, Oh Allah, guide all of the people on the planet. Because only Allah is the guide. And this is another form of da'wah, is what we give to Allah when we ask Him, Oh Allah, guide us, guide the people. Guide us, guide the people. All of this is in the framework of the da'wah. I want to share with you something. Some of the best callers to Islam that I've met, in fact, have come right out of here in India. They come all the way over to my country in the United States. And they shared with me something many years ago, and I learned this. It's a beautiful analogy. They said a person calling to Islam is similar to a farmer who is planting seeds in the ground. Because the farmer, in the daytime, he's planting his seeds. Hard working, taking care of the crop, cleaning the weeds away from it. And then he's what? He's trusting God to do something, but he's asking God, Oh Allah, make it rain. Oh Allah, make it rain. So in the daytime, he's planting and taking care of his crops. Then in the night, he's praying and crying, Oh Allah, make it rain. So in the same way, the one who calls to Islam does this. In the daytime, he plants the seeds. He tells the people, La ilaha illallah. There's no God to worship except Allah. Do deeds of righteousness. Do goodness and be kind to each other. Be charitable with each other. This is all a part of Islam. And then in the night, he gets up and he waters the crop. How does he do that? He does his da'wah to Allah. At night, O oh Allah, accept from me this effort that I've made. O oh Allah, accept from my parents. O oh Allah, accept from my relatives. O oh Allah, accept from the Muslims everywhere. O oh Allah, accept from the people on the planet and make all of us submit to you on your terms and make all of us good people. This is the best way. Dawa in the day, du'a in the night. And this will complete you as a human being. Constantly trying to be better at whatever you do. As a Muslim, be the best that you can. And then in the night, ask Allah, oh, forgive us for the shortcoming. Accept from us and guide all of us. What better way can we imagine to do this da'wah, the calling to Islam? One of the things that a lot of people ask me, we do receive a lot of emails, and I want to address one of the subjects that people will ask me about making da'wah to non-Muslims. How do we give this invitation to someone who's not a Muslim? Do we just walk up to them on the street like some religions do and begin trying to convert them? And in fact, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for us to walk up and start telling people things like, by the way, your religion is stupid, you're crazy, your book is, is nonsense, you're an idiot. Because any of this type of action shows us that in fact we didn't even understand our own religion. And Allah forbids us in the Quran to treat people like that. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, being the example for us, did not treat the people like that. When he called the people to the belief, he simply stated to them, there really is a God. He's one. He has no partners. And we should obey him. Whoever wanted to hear more about his message would sit with him, listen to him, and see what he had to offer. And if they had something that they wanted to say, they were free to speak their peace and say what they have. If he agreed with them, he would encourage them. And say, That's good. But if he didn't agree with them, he didn't encourage them in that area. They figured out pretty fast what was acceptable and what wasn't according to his response. For us as Muslims, we're not obligated to change what people believe. This is not our job to change the hearts of the people. The only heart that we're responsible for is our own heart. So that's why we begin with the real action on ourselves. So when we begin to talk to people, what if they say something harsh or evil or bad against Islam 
or against the Quran, or against Allah or His Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him. Well, in fact, this gives us an opportunity, really, a beautiful window to work through to get to the people. It might seem strange to you. Well, the person came to me and he was attacking my beliefs. He said a horrible thing. It's not true. He said bad stuff about our Quran. He said something against the law. What do you want me to do? I want to scream at this man. I want to holler at this lady. I want to, you know, react to what they're doing. Or I want to hibernate and get away from everybody. Neither of these are acceptable actions in Islam. The Prophet, peace be upon him, did not respond like that. But I'd like to share with you a way that we do this in our country. And I hope perhaps that it will help for you when you're talking with the people. When they begin to attack us, attack what we believe and what we stand for, what should we do in fact? Consider this as a model for you. Somebody says something harsh, tough, bad against Islam. And instead of responding back and saying, well, your religion's stupid too, it won't work. How about this? Somebody comes to you and said, why do you Muslims have to kill all the Christians and the Jews? Well, you and I know that's not true. It doesn't say that. But still, that's what they came to us with. So what we'll say back to them is this. Thank you for asking me about my religion. Well, they're going to go, what? Huh? Oh, no. I was trying to start a fight. Ah. So, but you don't respond to that. You say, thank you for asking me about my religion. In Islam, the first thing you need to know is we're commanded by Allah to tell the truth. If we don't tell the truth, we can go to hell forever. Now, you might not realize how valuable this is, by the way, but to the one that's not Muslim, he doesn't realize how much we value the truth and that we would rather die than lie because this is very bad in Islam to be a liar. A kadib, a liar, is not acceptable. He'll never go to paradise. So let them know that what we say is the truth as far as we know it and then as far as documentation, our proof is this. The Quran still exists exactly as it existed at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we don't worry about what's written on a piece of paper, although there are billions of Qurans out there exactly alike. But what we're most concerned about is the actual Quran itself. And Quran does not mean a book, it means recitation. And it's still recited today by 1.5 billion humans on the earth the same way it was recited 1400 years ago by the Muslims then. And today we have over 9 million Muslims who totally memorize the Quran. So there's no doubt about what it says. It's the most authenticated book on the planet, no doubt. Whether you choose to believe it or not, the fact is there is documentation to prove what it actually says in the Arabic language. And then next, the sayings and teachings of Muhammad are preserved and authenticated. And more is known about his life and documented about his life than any other human on the earth. There are more biographies about him than any other person. Now, considering these two points, the next thing we mentioned to the person is that a lot of questions, by the way, are not really questions. They're statements followed by a question mark, and the statements may not be true. And if you came to me and said, can I ask you a question? We said, yeah, go ahead, ask a question. And you said, it's a yes or no question. You have to say yes or no. Okay. Is your mother out of jail yet? Huh? My mother's not in jail. No. Yes or no? Is your mother out of jail? Well, well, she's never been in jail. No. Yes or no? Well, she's not in jail, so therefore, okay. Yes, she's out of jail. Ah, I'm glad she got out. You see what happens? It's a trick question. It's not a question, really. It's a statement trying to force you to say something that doesn't really ring true. Move to the next part. I want to give you the answer to your question. And I'm asking you to consider this, that as I give you the answer to the question, are you prepared? That if you find answers in this that you like for yourself and you say, gee, I didn't know that. This is something good. I like it for me. Then are you prepared to rethink your position and consider doing what Islam calls you to do, which is to worship your Lord and my Lord, your God and my God on his terms. That's all Islam is about. Having said that, give them the answer. Nowhere in the Quran does Allah tell us to kill Christians and Jews. The order for fighting is actually an order for combat against those who are combating you. And it's not a self-defense mechanism like some people have said. It's an actual combat going to war, even stopping them by combat before they can come to you and do it to you. Similar to what we've done in the past was called preemptive strikes. The same thing that's being condoned today around the world. It was condoned by Islam. It's not something new, but for sure, 
Allah says in the Quran, you can fight them where they fight you. You can turn them out from where they turned you out from to reclaim your property or your land. But if they stop, you have to stop. You must not transgress the limits. Because verily Allah does not love the transgressors. So for us to be oppressors or transgressors is totally out of Islam. If there is oppression, transgression, or oppression of any type where people are in what's called in Arabic fitna, then the answer is to stop this fitna, to stop this kind of oppression, terrorism. For instance, this is a horrible oppression. And Islam is against terrorism and developed the system to defeat terrorism 1400 years ago. It's called Jihad Sibililah. The answer to fight terrorism is what? To do jihad sibililah. And jihad does not mean holy war. It means to struggle and strive through every means possible. Through media, through the economic system, through your good preaching ways to show the people the right way and calling the people to the right way. And if necessary, combat, but only to what extent that people are combating you. And if you are the aggressor, you must stop because it's not permissible in Islam. When you've answered this question, how many times have I answered this question and watched the people say, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. In fact, we like that. You have to like it. If you're an American or a Western person and you said, well, gee, I don't like the idea of combating people that combat us, then you're telling Mr. Bush you don't like what he said. He's saying essentially that. We're going to combat the people who combated us. So... And then when you think, you go, but it does make sense. Isn't it permissible for a person to defend themselves? And certainly isn't it a right of a total people to present their issues? And if you don't get your issues answered, you're not allowed to go to war over that. That's not the point. But if people are attacking you, you have to defend the innocent, defend the women, defend the children, because that's a part of Islam. Then after you answer the question, the people say, gee, I like that, does it make sense? And you say, okay, then what do you think? Maybe you'd like to begin to worship your Lord without any partners.